There are some very striking words in the story of the wise men that we often hear at Christmas or Epiphany time. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 19 tells us this. Then they returned to their country by another road. It's easy to miss the big message in there. When we meet with Jesus and bow down and worship him, our lives will be changed. And our journey through life from then on will be via a different path. Talking about creatures of habit, I woke up one day to the fact that when I walked my dog, I always walked her round the park in a clockwise direction. I also noticed that most other people walking their dogs did the same thing, and I began to wonder why. I think there may be two reasons for this. Firstly, on closer observation, the layout of the paths in the park actually leads you in a clockwise direction. All but one infrequently used entrance leads you into the park and take you in a clockwise way. A few feet in, there is a junction and you can take it if you wish, but this path straight on leads you into the park in a much easier way. So it's much simpler and easier to follow. And who, after all, on a stroll in the park wants to make the efforts of big decisions? Who, after all, is awake enough at that time of day to realise that there could be a decision to make? The second reason for the walking in that direction is all to do with dogs. More specifically, the dog you see coming walking towards you. I mean, is it a friendly dog? Or, or what kind of violence would there be when their dog and my dog meet head on? I, of course, am never wary of meeting up with other human beings in the park. It's always my dog's fault. So sensible dog owners decide it's better to walk away from the incoming enemy or at least to follow behind them at a, a safe distance between you, a distance you can control. In the case of Nina, my dog, the decision was usually taken out of my hands. She always walked away, and if not away, then what she'd do was do a wide circle round behind them, keeping the other dogs at a safe distance of her own choosing. Then she feels safe. So clockwise it is. And if I'm feeling unsociable too, I'm more than happy to comply. But thinking about it, there may be a parable of life here. How much of our lives is spent channeled in one direction or another by social norms and other things? And who lays the paths? Who decides which way we walk? We like to think we're free, don't we? But if we're honest, we know that we're all subject to social manipulation virtually all of the time. We're told what to wear, what essential gadgets we need, what foods to eat, even what we should think. Sometimes it's all so obvious, as with the adverts on the television, or the pretentious followers of fashion. Oh, that's so last year. Other times it's far more subtle, like the political biases of our newspapers, or the corporate funding of scientific research claiming to be unbiased. And don't let us forget... There's always lies, damn lies, and statistics. Sometimes it's so subtle that you don't realise that you're being led and you don't consider that you actually have a choice. Before you know it, you've passed the junction and you're walking clockwise just like everyone else. Now, I am a non-conformist minister and a big part of me is non-conformist by nature. I like to think outside of the box, to explore alternatives, to be different. Hence the time I thrived as a teenager when I became a punk rocker, dressing rather differently to everyone else. That was before punk became just another trend. And that was long before we realised that punk itself was a clever advertising ploy for Malcolm McLaren and Vivian Westwood and their clothing store. But my nonconformity is, is not just part of my personality. It's something I recognise is called out of me and all who name themselves Christians. 
We're meant to be countercultural, citizens of heaven, in the world but not of the world, people who declare that Jesus, not Caesar, is Lord. The first name given to Christians was people of the way. In other words, they were people who were seen to be living and walking in a different direction to everyone else. And so it is that in Matthew 7, Jesus spoke of two ways. There's a broad way through the wide open gate that most people follow and which leads to death and disaster. It's given many names by the translators and commentators. Some might call it a highway to nowhere. We perhaps know it as best as the highway to hell. Yet there is an alternative if we'll look for it. It's marked by a narrow gate, which we know from the Gospels is cross-shaped. The good news for those who feel they have no choice, that they're trapped forever in a lifeless routine, who's without purpose and full of brokenness, people who can see full well where they're headed because they know full well what they are made of, and it's not pretty. But there is another way. There is a way in which we can live life in its fullness, walking through life as we were made to, in not just an awareness, but a close relationship with God, our loving Father from whom we have been estranged. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus died, to open up that way, which is there for all of us, should we take it. But here we're reminded that the gate is narrow. My mind jumps to the eye of the needle that Jesus told us was so hard for a rich man to go through. Whether he meant an actual eye of a needle or a narrow gate in the city wall that went by the same name, the point he was making was the same. And it's that this gate is so narrow, we just can't get through with all our baggage. All that we count as riches, our wealth, our pride, our achievement, and all of the rubbish we carry around as heavy weights on our shoulders, you know, our guilt, our shame, our hurt and bitterness. These are huge burdens that just cannot fit through. We have to put them down at the foot of the cross and squeeze through without them. We can put them down at the foot of the cross and squeeze through without them. Finding release as we come empty before God and step out unburdened and free to live as we're meant to live in the glorious freedom of the children of God. But Jesus makes no pretense that this is easy. In fact, he says it's a hard road to travel going through a very narrow gate and few people travel it. Yet this is the way to life, he insists, and we have a choice. Go in through the narrow gate, he pleads. It was Billy Graham, on one of the few occasions I heard him preach, who opened my eyes to understand the reason why the narrow way is so hard. It's because, he pointed out, we're not talking about two different paths going in different directions or, or even two paths running parallel to each other. We're talking about a wide path with a massive flow of people on it going one way and then a narrow path with a few people on it going right up the middle of that first path but in the opposite direction. Have you ever tried walking against the flow of a crowd? It's not easy, is it? The force of bodies will push you back. Their anger at you being such a pain and getting their way will make you want to give up and turn around. They will shout, don't you know it's a one-way street? And they may not believe you and certainly won't like it if you try to tell them different. It's far easier to go with the flow. But where does that take us? Well aware of the dangers, Paul cries out to us. He says, don't conform to the ways of the world. That's brilliantly translated by J.B. Phillips as, 
Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mould. But instead, let God remould your minds from within so that you may prove in practice that plan for you which is good and that meets all his demands and moves towards the goal of maturity. There is another way. And we're called to walk in it. And when we do, we not only enjoy that freedom for ourselves, we also reveal the possibility of freedom for others. If people see us walking in the other direction, they may realise that they can do so too. Now when the Bible says we're all witnesses, that means we are, whether we like it or not, kind of adverts for the kingdom. People are watching us and judging the gospel by our actions. We can be good adverts or witnesses, or we can be bad adverts, but we will be one or the other. And what we are called to be are alternative role models in life. Here it is, the ultimate punk rocker's dream. That's what Romans 12 describes in some way. Can you imagine what it would be like if people met with us and saw a people with a completely different mindset? People comfortable in their own skin because they know they're valued for who they are and they don't have to try to be someone else. People whose love is totally sincere, who are hardworking and resilient even in times of trouble, who freely and gladly share their lives and possessions with others, and perhaps most of all, who respond to persecution with a blessing, rule out revenge, feed their hungry enemies, and overcome evil with good. That's radical. That's countercultural stuff. And if people see it in us, they may believe it possible for themselves. So what did I do that morning when walking with my dog in the park? I'll tell you what I did. I turned round and I walked the other way. A simple experiment to see if by doing so others would realise there was a choice and they would decide to do the same. Most people didn't. But it was still worthwhile actually because instead of walking away from people, I found myself walking towards them, drawn out of myself and my own little thoughts and enabled to step beyond my fear and caution to engage with others. I hope that as I walk with my God, I might also choose to turn around and walk the other way, to repent and follow Jesus in old fashioned terms. I hope that the way I walk through life will show others that there is an alternative path. I hope that I will step out to meet them without fear, greet them as friends, share the good news, and maybe, maybe then we will walk on together in the same direction, following Christ together until his come, the kingdom comes. What say you?